Belize Zoo was founded in 1983 by Sharon Matola. Since then, the animal population at the zoo has increased, as well as the zoo's reputation. In this edition of Belize Watch, we invite you to join our Belize Watch team as we walk through the zoo with Director Celso Put, Conservation Program Manager Jamal Andrew and Bone, and General Curator Umberto Wallers. We will begin our tour after we hear from our partners, Belize Natural Energy Charitable Trust, the Barry. Shell Belize and the National Gas Company. We are the Barry, offering you great products, good service, and of course, the lowest prices in the entire country. Visit us in Belize City, Bermapan, San Ignacio Cayo, Old York, and now in San Pedro, La Isla Bonita. The Barry, get more, feelings. Shell V Power with three times more cleaning and friction reducing molecules. Go well, go Shell. Since 2008, the Belize Natural Energy Charitable Trust has created opportunities for Belizeans to develop themselves and their communities. The Trust employs tools that are intuitive, collaborative, and accessible so that every Belizean is empowered to achieve their full potential. Over 200,000 Belizeans have been impacted because of our various initiatives. The Belize Natural Energy Charitable Trust, empowering Belizeans of today to create the Belize of tomorrow. I remember the days when trucks used to line up the Guatemala border and we could have only watch as they come in loaded with LPG and then left with we Belizean dollars. Things change since, because the Belizeans they drive now, that we have the jobs and are definitely proud to be able to keep my dollars home. Either Elvis Roaches and either one of the Belizean drivers for the National Gas Company. I haul butane from the new state-of-the-art terminal that the port of Big Creek. The hard work, but at the end of the day, I go home to my family and provide for them. Thanks to NGC, I did do my leap out to build my country. We the all Belizeans on this team, and we're proud to work hard to deliver one product will last longer and give you more value for money. I proud to work at NGC, and for you we Belizean people. The National Gas Company Belize Limited, fueling Belize forward. We are at the Belize Zoo, and uh, you know I have always enjoyed a visit to the zoo, but I have not been. I must confess, sir, so I have not been here for quite some time, and I want to thank you for welcoming me here today. Well, thanks for coming, Chief. It's been almost twelve years. Yes. Yeah. Since I formally came to the Belize Zoo, I've 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 been here informally and several times in between, but to see a formal visit and walking around. It's been about 12 years indeed. Well, it's a pleasure having you, and um, I hope we can show you the transformation that has happened over the last 12 years. I'm looking forward to seeing it. I remember, and uh, you know, it makes me feel sad at this time, but I am, nevertheless, I, I'm sure she would want us not to feel sad, but she would want us to she would say, what, why, why, why do you feel sad about, right? Because the last time when I came, Sharon was here, Sharon Matola, the founder of the zoo, and Sharon was here, she received me, and we started our show right here. It was just after Hurricane Richard, right? And I think we, she was just getting the, starting the recovery process after Hurricane Richard, if I recall properly. So let's do something, sir. So let's dedicate this walkthrough and this show to her memory. How about that? Definitely, Chief. Um, one, one of Sharon's final wishes was for us to keep her memory alive and, and for us to remind 
Belizeans and visitors to the zoo that, that she was the driving force behind the development, the foundation of the Belize Zoo and Tropical Education Center. And like, like this Guanacaste tree behind us um, that fell during Hurricane Richard, this tree never gave up. This tree actually sprung and you have life if, you, if the cameraman could show the different sprouts that came up. It's, uh, who compares Sharon to that? Sharon never did give up when she started the zoo. She always moved forward and she had a very, very clear vision of sharing Belizean wildlife with visitors to the zoo, but more importantly, to Belizean, especially the school kids. And so that is what we, we hope that, that we can highlight during this tour today of the Belize Zoo. And the tapir is a, the our national animal is right behind this tree, right? Uh, right? Because I can recall her worried about the tapir being affected by the tree. That is well, correct. This uh, this Guanacaste tree actually fell and, and broke the tapir exhibit and uh, basically had us making changes. Um, and as Sharon always be, um, she think outside the box and she created this little platform like a tree house. Mm -hmm. And so we can walk up this tree house now and we can have a look at the tapir. It's our national animal and it's a correct place to start a tour of the Belize Zoo. That is correct. Right? The tapir is our national animal. We're very um, proud of that for sure. All right. Did you lead the way, sir? So this is yes, Elzo. Um, Indy is our representative national animal, the Central American tapir. Um, you see he's nibbling on that dry vine there. Tapirs are herbivores, so mm. they eat plants, fruits, leaves, twigs. They don't eat meat. Um, one of the stories Sharon used to always hear about um, farmers telling is that a tapir will skin your dog live. Okay. And it gives it a bad name, right? It gives it a black eye, so people used to scare at them. But we think they're just gentle herbivores, yeah. right? Um, they don't eat meat, so there's no reason to be scared of them. Mind you, though, if they have young one, they are very defensive like any animal would be. They would just defend their young one. But they grow to a very large size. This would be a small tapir, or what, what, what size would this be? Would, would Indy be? Yeah, this Indy is an adult tapir. Um, in the wild, the tapir will be a lot bigger. They can get as much as 550 to 600 pounds. Um, in the zoo, we've seen that the, the ones especially that were brought here as pets, uh, they have sort of like a stunt growth, so they don't get as big or as heavy as those that you'll see in the wild. What's the story behind Indy? How did Indy end up here? So Indy... Um, came from Independence Village in, oh, in southern Belize, so the hence the name Indy. Okay. Yeah, um, was Indy a pet? Yeah. Yeah, so Indy was confiscated by, by Forest Department and um, brought to the zoo for uh, eventually um, a proper home, no? Have other companions, um, or, or is yeah, he here definitely. By what we'll do is we'll take a walk through what we call tapir tongue because this whole area of tapir and okay. each tapir where we have um, have a unique story as to how it got to the zoo, including two that were born here at the zoo. Yeah, I see some children and the teachers visiting and looking to take a selfie with the tapir. <laughs> yeah, the tapir are one of the favorite animal in the zoo. Um, yeah. You know, Sharon celebrated April the Tapir birthday for 30 years, and we used to get school kids from all across Belize. I mean, I personally witnessed two generations of Belizean getting educated by April the Tapir. Um, I saw kids coming to the zoo later on as adults with their children to come and celebrate April birthday. So Sharon, in her lifetime, saw three generations of Belizeans Getting education by getting educated by April the Tapir, and, and so everybody who comes to the zoo always know about the Tapir and they look for the Tapirs them especially. And how did she find April? Uh, remind me. 
Um, I will defer that to Umberto because Umberto oh, would have a better um, history of that. Umberto, let, let's meet. Let's meet Umberto. Umberto. Nice um, uh, yeah, I, I remember when we did the tour. You were you were wrong. I was part uh, of that tour as well. Yes, with the, the, tour, yeah. the tour we did. Yeah, the, the ta we were asking about the tapir. Oh, April the tapir. April, how did right? The okay, so so a gentleman from um, Kamalote village mm -hmm. found the baby tapir, mm -hmm. and at that time it wasn't um, a zoo. It was just you know a collection that they had mm -hmm. um, where it started, where the zoo started, mm -hmm. and Sharo was in charge of of uh, feeding the animals, taking care of them. Mm. And April was sort of the first tapir that came there. Yeah. Uh, but she came infected with screwworms. Mm -hmm. At that time, Belize was, oh, you know, that was, that was out there. And um, April made it. She survived. And April used to walk around freely around the house. N there was no enclosure at that yeah. time. And, you know, April just became a symbolic animal. And she used to hang around with Sharon, swim in the, in the pond with Sharon. Mm -hmm. So that is how, you know, the story of, of, of April. Yeah. When did April die? Um, she died no in November? 2013. 2013. 2013. Yeah, 2013. Yeah. 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 But she was very famous, a very, very iconic figure here in the zoo. You couldn't come to the zoo and not see April. Everybody comes to the zoo, they look for April. April. But they still can come to the zoo and look for her bones now at the entrance of the zoo. Oh yeah? Yep. So we missed that. So we have to pay a little bit to April. Yeah, but we look, uh, we uh, need uh, to look uh, at the structure of, of April's, you know, the skeleton and all that. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Sure thing. Yeah. All right. So, so, so where do we go now? Um, let's, let's take a walk through Tapir Tongue and then we get to, to, to feed, do some only enrichment with them basically. Give, give the... We get in there some food, make it come up close so you could see. Okay, let's do that. All right, here we go. Okay, so, so this is um. The, uh, actually, we're meeting with Francisco, one of our zookeeper. Francisco has been with us for twelve years, going on to twelve years, yes, and he is currently working as one of the tapir keepers them. So Francisco, you could just share yeah. with us what share you have here. What, 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 you're feeling, what are you feeding the tapirs today, Francisco? Well, we have um, fruits. We feed our tapirs with fruits and vegetables. So you can see some of the fresh vegetables that we give our animals here. Um, deer, deer food, which carries um, all the fruits and veggies. Even you just have fruit, and, uh, watermelon, cucumber, um, pineapple, um, carrots. The animals ain't good. Very healthy. Very healthy yeah. indeed. You know, um, we, we did decide uh, maybe I'll lose some of my, the weight that I have, not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you do this on a daily basis? So how often uh, do you feed these animals? Twice a day. We feed our animals twice a day. Mm. So this is for morning, and, and again, we will do another preparation in the evening. You have yeah. to get a lot of fruits, and how, of fruits. How, do you, how do you get your fruits? Um, where do you get them from? Uh, Who purchase, supply you? We purchase from the market. Fresh fruits, like on Tuesdays and Fridays, mm. uh, those are the days when we get our fruits here. But you must have to give a whole <laughs> lot of fruits because I'm sure that only the period lot, fruits. It's lot, yes, yeah. it's a lot of fruits. Yeah. yeah. So how long have you been here? Twelve years, I'm told. Yes, twelve. Uh -huh. Twelve. And you enjoy your job here. Yeah? Yeah. It's full. It's the nicest <laughs> ever job here. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, nice meeting you, man. And I want to wish you all the best. And I guess I'll follow you so we could see you feed the tapir. Right. We we'll yes. do that, right? Over. Okay. Yeah. So yes, Chief, we do two tongue trips. We call it tongue trips um, weekly. Um, we have one staff dedicated just to doing that. He goes to the market, 5.30 in the morning, and they out there to make sure yeah. he, yes, in the out there to make sure he get the best produce for the animals. And that is one of the things we, we, we like to share with Belizeans because when we ask for donations, sometimes we get food that are about to spoil, but ah. the animals at the zoo eat the best. The best uh, and, and the reason is that if you bring fruits or veggies that are at the point of spoiling, you know, they contaminate the others and they speed up the process of like fermentation and mm -hmm. other things like that. And so that's that the reason we ask, give me fresh fruit, give me fresh food, no? Yeah. So we're interacting with Indy here, no? Yes, this is Indy. Okay. Got it, Berto. Take over. Okay, let's see. Let's see what Indy. Berto, Berto, Berto. Okay. So you, you Chief, you want to feed the... But he got some big teeth, man. Yes, because... Um, 
Let me see. Related to horses. Yes. All right. And, and rhinos. So yeah, just, just let's go like that. Yes. Okay. I don't know why bite. I why take my finger from my mistake. You know. <laughs> but you know your business. There you are. I think the school is cutting him. Um, by nature, they're, 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 they're not docile animals. As yeah. What Celso said, no, if they have young ones in there. You know, it's it's it's, it's, it's an, a privilege. I think we Belizeans to try and get this experience of feeding a national animal. You know, come to the zoo, feed a national animal. You don't have to afraid. Right. We have um, set experiences here as well, so you know it is it is something that that helps us generate some money to feed the animals. Yeah. So we sell experiences here um, by feeding you know carrot sticks or mm -hmm. or celery, and you know it it gives the animal an interaction as well, and people can actually learn about the tapir. Yeah. yeah. Scratch them too, no? Yeah, scratch them right here while they eat. You, uh -huh. know, you could scratch them. And you could feel, you know, how tough that skin is. Yeah, really tough. Um, yeah, very tough. Right. It's a good experience, you know. I, I think, um, like I say, most Belizean should at least try this at least one time. Yeah. Definitely one time or yeah, more. Or more. Or every time they come to the zoo, yeah. this is this is what uh, our what's highlight here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not my hand. They you know the difference in my hand. You see? Mm -hmm. They don't smell like carrots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They don't taste like carrots. Yeah. Okay. Indy, we have fed you, so hope you enjoyed it. This is just a snack. What we're going to have is breakfast. A little late breakfast, you know. But mm. A little late breakfast. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. You want to say something, Indy? Tell me, Liz, hello. In the man. Interesting. And they say he's still hungry. Yeah. Got most of my carrots. All right. No need to share with the rest. <laughs> okay. So this is tapir tongue. Right. Wow, amazing. Okay, go this way. So while till white, white till yeah, white till there. They're occupied. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so, so Jamal, last time we were here as well, right? You were with me on the show. Yes. That we did the last time on, on, on Charon. I remember you were you, you, you were wrong. Yes. We were we were young at that time, right? Yes, I think I, think I was. <laughs> <laughs> I think last time we interviewed the deer as well, but they're occupied at the moment. Yes. So they're, they're, the white-tailed deer are interesting because we do, as you can imagine, we get a lot of international visitors and they come for the, for them exotic, right? Our native animals are exotic, the tapir, the jaguar, but mm -hmm. it's, I think, always, it's always a cool thing for them to see animals that they're probably familiar with in their backyards, mm -hmm. like the white-tailed deer, because this is a species you do get in North America. Uh -huh. And so they come and they see, you know, a species that is very domestic to them or very well known, just on a smaller scale, so it's it's always nice to show them the animals that we share in common throughout the region, right? They're not just tropical, they're temperate, they go through Mexico, North America, so they can see the, um, the parallels. These guys, of course, are a lot smaller, mm -hmm. but they're just like in the, nor in the north, they're hunted for meat, Belizeans hunt them, jaguars hunt them, pumas hunt them, so they're, they're an important food source mm -hmm. for both humans and, and uh, predators in the wild, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 
when when somebody sells you their meat or so it would be something like from this at this little beautiful yep. deer here yes it would be most likely the white tailed deer we have the um the red brocket deer we don't have one at the zoo anymore unfortunately but there is a red brocket species a much smaller one that is also native to belize and both of them have a a season where you can hunt them right so as long as you're hunting in in season and you have the permits then of, of course it's something that Permit. is permitted no yeah yes and also you have several here you have yes. uh, what these what three four five well, I must say seven or eight of them we have i think we have let's see there's five here and then we do have one that's on his own yashkin who's mm -hmm. our most recent deer we got him a couple years ago he was actually a rescue so a family in southern belize found him named him and, and brought him to the zoo and asked us to keep the name. Um, so he's, he's our most recent intake. So he's a good example of how some of the animals get here. Yeah. Not all of them are confiscated or taken by the forest department. There are, there are Belizeans, good Samaritans, that find these animals and, and um, either bring them or ask the zoo to intervene and help this animal. So we have, you know, April is a good example. All of these animals are here because Belizeans did the right thing to, to help this, these animals out of a challenging situation they were in. So what numbers would they call since um, we are talking about this help? that um, the zoo gives uh, well, well just remind of the numbers in case somebody um you can call our number is 613-4966 and we're also on social media so we often get um animal animal emergency requests even on facebook and instagram and we answer daily so you can reach us however by phone whatsapp yeah. call whatsapp um facebook message the zoo is is always online uh -huh. so we're always responding to and if it's if it's animals that we're not immediately nearby, we have a network of animal responders that we can reach out to, so the animal gets gets the care it needs. And no. Is that, uh, the, a little gibnat there. That's uh, that's an agouti, or what we call what Belizean call the bush rabbit, bush right? Rabbit. Yeah. All so right. these are the daytime version. The, the gibnat is um, nocturnal, no. Yeah. So that's the other cool thing with like cousin, right? Close exactly. Cousin. They're both mm. in the yeah, rodent family. The same. And then you see a lot of piam piam brown jays up in the trees waiting to take their piece of breakfast. Yeah. So yeah. the cool thing with with visiting the zoo as well, apart from the animals you expect to see, is all the animals you don't expect yeah. or you don't plan on. That's correct. That's right. No, that's him. That's Same that's him. Agouti. Agouti, yeah. yeah. That's it. We're taking a walk it's through. Still tongue, right? Yeah, this, it's over this side here, basically, where we have, we have, what, four, five tapirs this side? Mm. Five tapirs in, in the area. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we have three. Three in this particular area. And then we have a new area where we just expanded, um, just saw the tapir and have more space no okay so one of the thing is we try our best to provide them as much habitat as we can okay. um while they're in captive management here okay this but there has horns is that, that this is a male which, which one which one does have the, the horns the male or the female this is the male this is the yashkin that jamal mentioned um uh -huh. so you have a antler yeah So uh, he is, the reason you see him in an excluded area is that he's being introduced to the other there because he knew, right? And oh. we, we, don't, we don't know what the reaction would be from them to him or him to them. So we have this Lee exclusion fence where he can come and they can interact. Uh -huh. And eventually is to put them together so they just be one, one collection. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. You give them names? Like you know yeah. my name, right? Yeah, this one, the Yashkin. Yashkin. This, this is the one that um, the, the person who brought him to the zoo brought him with his name already, no? Yashkin. Yashkin. All right. So we got Tapir Tongue, and, and one of the interesting things about Tapir Tongue, we highlight one of the, the, the biggest threat to Tapir Zina Belize, which is road collision, especially in central Belize. You know, we. We recently had the John Smith Road built, the Burrell Boom Road has been there, and those roads cut into areas where you find a high diversity of tapirs. Uh -huh. It's not the best place for tapirs, but what happened is the development is pushing tapirs to these areas, uh -huh. and tapirs have to cross the road, and when they cross the road, they're being hit by cars. Uh -huh. Between 2008 and 2021, We've recorded more than 30 tapirs getting hit by cars wow. in that area. How many? Yeah. In the John Smith? Uh, John no, Smith. no, not the John Smith. But when you put John Smith and Boom together, you get over 30. Over 30. And wow. one, of the, one of the biggest concerns for us is tapirs are what we call animal with low reproductive rate. Uh -huh. 
what that means is that one tapir will have one calf every three years, more or less, oh. because they have a gestation period of 13 months. But they seem to be very smart because I'm looking at this one here. This is this one is while I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm, my eyes caught, caught him. This a him or her? That's a him. Uh huh. Um, and he, he seems to be, as while we walk, he seems to be walking along with us. Right, and and well, that so. <laughs> It's good that you notice that, Chief, because one of the challenges we have is a lot of people would say, why don't you release the animal in the wild? Uh -huh. But he has modified behavior. He used to human. Mm -hmm. And so if we should release this tapir into the wild, he get close to human, he get used to human, so he start to look for them, find them, because we are associated with food. Mm -hmm. So he don't know who birth today with we with a little bucket of treat, okay. so he want to follow we. And that is more or less the behavior they portray when you release them back into the wild after they've been in captivity. Or sometimes people have them as pets um, and, and then they try to release them back into the wild and they find that the animal keep coming back and they say, oh, the animal get used to me. And that is, that is a fact that the animal get used to you, but they associate you with food. Yes. That is why they say things like a crocodile. You don't you don't feed a crocodile because the day exactly. that you show up, that you show up without the food, then you become the food. Right. Or if you don't show up with food, whatever you find become the food. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. So there's another tapir over here. Uh, but I, I, it's amazing how they keep following us. You know, like they go from one cage to the next. But if you come like wrong one thirty. Uh -huh. They and they sleep dead. Siesta time. Siesta? That's yeah. Like, well, like how we take our siesta. Yes. This, this one is Sparks, huh? This is Sparks. Uh -huh. and, and Sparks is, is one of those that was born here at the zoo. Spar Spark actually is, is it three or four? He's four years old now. Um, and we would consider him a mature tapir, you know? So he would be, mm. I mean, Let's say there was a breeding program. He would probably be a good candidate for breeding, no? Okay. Um, because you know his entire history, anyway. Right, correct. But but the man healthy as well. Mm -hmm. um, so Spark is uh, the product of Fuego, uh -huh. which the fire, uh -huh. and Navidad, Christmas. Uh -huh. So we get one of these Spark here. Okay. Here, buddy. Here, bud. I spark my little carrot, man. Hi, Spark. It's amazing how the, the teeth are so huge, but yet they don't use it on you. You know, they know exactly that they they wouldn't reach for my hand. Well, you know, they they are well cared for. I mean. And I guess that's why some people would say they would skin your dog because, mm -hmm. I mean, they have, look the at the teeth, the teeth yeah, yeah. I mean, after all, they're related to to horses, you know, and uh -huh. a lot of people get horse bite, and, and that's not a pretty sight, you know, yeah. so. And also remember we meet Francisco, they come up with food. So, yes, so they're, right. they're, they're so actively waiting so for Francisco waiting for as well. Francisco, yeah. So we, we, we just brought you appetizers. Wow. Right. Just, a, just an appetizer. So okay. Food coming shortly. No entry, staff only. That's correct. So <laughs> what, that, huh? Well, actually that's where the management pen are for the animals. So some animals like like especially like the monkeys them that we're going to see the spider monkeys uh -huh. not all of them come out for the day so we rotate them because we have different troops okay so no entry means don't go back there because you don't know where you're gonna find okay yeah so the guy is healing healing us on the tree there welcoming us this is the spider monkey right these are the spider monkeys so in belize we have two species of monkeys we we have we have the spider monkeys and we have the holler monkeys mm. Most people are familiar with the holler monkey because of the community baboon sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And the spider monkeys, you'll find them more on in this undisturbed area, no? So, uh, you know, the forest. So the, the, the spider monkey um, is larger than the holler monkey, the, the, the baboon? Good question. Um, who heavier? 
I think the baboon might be heavier. The, the howler monkey heavier. So I mean, uh -huh. when, when you say bigger, <laughs> but in size, in in, so in, in see, length. So these guys uh, tend to stand up. Yeah. On 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 their hind legs, right? And uh -huh. so they would appear they much appear, they appear taller, taller than than the than the howler. Who, when you find them, they're more slouch and uh -huh. and moving about. Uh -huh. and, and the spider, they tend to stand up more on on their hind legs. But definitely, so the howler monkey is fatter. It's, I mean, it's bigger. Yeah. Big, has yeah. more weight. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Uh -huh. But. Um, and also, if, if you look at their behavior, the spider monkeys are more active than the howler monkeys. Mm -hmm. And that could also give you an indication of their diet. So these guys, very active. They need a lot of protein. They need a lot of energy. And so they have a very diverse um, list of food items. While the howler monkey, then just chill and they want to eat one leaf here and eat one leaf there. They might come across a fruit. But these guys actively search for food because they burn a lot of energy. Which one travel more? Because I know that they would travel from tree, tree to tree and, and, and along in the, in the forest. Which one would travel more, the howler or the spider? The, the spider monkey will definitely travel longer distance, uh, yeah. searching for food, searching for meat. Yeah. Um, just moving across the forest, the spider monkey will definitely tra travel longer distances. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you, Sylvia. It's unusual to see spider monkeys on the ground. You wouldn't see this on the, in the wild, but this is a it's an enclosed area. It's safe. They know there's no predators nearby. Um, spider monkeys spend most of their life up in the trees. They're very arboreal. They're built for that. They have the tail that could hold the whole body. They have the the long fingers. So they would only come on the forest floor if there's really no food or water to be found. And uh -huh. you know, if you see them on the ground, they look very stressed. They're watching over their shoulder because you know anything could come and get them. This is they're not as agile on the ground, they're at a disadvantage. So this behavior you're seeing is unique to the zoo. You know, it's, it's okay because, again, this is part of their routine, it's enclosed. So they're quite comfortable coming to the ground for treats when we're here, but um, it wouldn't be a wild behavior you would see. And then as you notice, once they grab what they want, back up, right back up in the trees where they're at home, no? So they're, they're built for a life in the trees. But it's, it's amazing, you know, how they walk erect. Look at this mm -hmm. one, walking yep. just like a person. See? Yes, Look and at even they, sometimes they run, just they like take off. There you go. Yeah. There, we, there, <laughs> there we go. Except they got a tail. Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. Which but, has, that yeah. does a lot for their balance, too. So the tail uh -huh. is, is, you know, as important as our arms and legs. It's like a fifth appendage, a fifth limb that they need. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and you see, they support the whole body with it. So another cool thing with them is that their hands, their feet, and even their tail, has its own unique print, so you could you could ID fingerprint a spider monkey or even a howler monkey just on its the the um the impression that the the skin leaves from the tail, the feet, and the hands. You, you, so you are telling me that just like how they would uh, imprint our fingers, yes, they would do the same thing to the spider to the monkey. Yep. So here's an example for you. We have this. So these are the footprints of one of the monkeys. So it has a unique texture and oh. just by comparison you have one of the zookeepers putting their hand to mm. so you know it's their feet because they don't have thumbs on their hands they only have four long fingers right it helps with grabbing branches more quickly the thumb doesn't get in the way so because this image here has the th the, the thumb or the big toe you know it's that it's that their it's their feet so that's how they can kind of stand upright and balance on on tree tops no you make i start to believe so related to them on people <laughs> too or we related to them okay you know they start they walk straight there yep they're, they're so intelligent. Yeah. Well, they're, they're, they're primates, no? And they, you know, evolutionists say that humans were part of the primate group and we have a common ancestor. So we know we not come from monkey, but we share somewhere down the line there is a common ancestor, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So you could see that in animals like primates and like in the apes too, which we don't have in Belize, but you can see some similarities. And intelligence too, they're one of the smartest animals we have at the zoo. And for that reason, I think we have this set up because them, with or without food, they're usually very interactive with the public. Uh -huh. So even strangers will come and sit down, they will watch, and they're very curious and they respond to, to presence. So they, they're, very, they're very interactive animals. Uh -huh. So I think this is a spot a lot of people spend a lot of time at just watching the monkeys. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I would spend some time here myself yeah. you know, looking at various types of behavior. Yeah. They make noise? Uh, they do, they make little trills and, and, and almost like a, a whistle. And when they're really, really upset, they make like a, a loud huffing noise. So it's, it's not as loud as the howlers, but it's like an alarm call and all of them get into it. So if there's like a, an opossum or a, something that, a, a large snake that might threaten them, they start making a big racket and shaking branches, throwing sticks and so on to try to move the, um, the intruder, you know?
So when we hear that the keepers come running to see what the issue is, because that's, you know, that's a concern that something's not right. Raising an alarm. Correct, exactly. And it's loud. You could hear it throughout the zoo. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Oh, use the hand this time. <laughs> Sometimes they do though, they reach out. They, aha, there you go, fantastic. So again, like a, it's like a, an additional limb, very, very, um, very dexterous. <laughs> but for that reason, like I said, we have to keep a distance because sometimes they reach out and try grab your, pr your pants foot when you know they look and stuff like that. So they're, they're, they're too smart for their own good sometimes. Spider monkeys. I like, I like when they sort of stretch, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Upright, straight Upright. back. Yeah. Amazing. Yep. And most of these you're seeing here, Chief, are, are um, formerly from the, the pet trade. So mm. monkeys are one of the, the animals. It's, it's gotten much better in the recent years, but we used to have a chronic issue with people trying to keep um, howler and spider monkeys as pets. And one, for one, it's illegal. It's against the law, but also they, they make really bad pets for a variety of reasons. They can get very aggressive. There's what you call zoonotic diseases, so disease and illness that can pass from humans to monkeys and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And they're a very social animal. So to have one monkey, you know, confined to a, in a house or on a chain in the yard, which we've seen, that's like the extreme of it because they get so aggressive, is very damaging to their mental health. And mm -hmm. they don't have the, the socialization they need to thrive. So they're always in a group, or most of the time they're in a group in the wild. So they need a lot of space to, to branch out to um, explore and also to bond with one another. That's part of their mental development. So the only two types of monkeys we have in Belize are the howler monkeys and the spider monkeys. Correct. And we'll see the howler a little later on. Yes, and hopefully hear them as well. Yeah. Yep. And both of them are on the endangered species list. They're both on the red list. Wow. Yeah, there's not many of them left in the wild. Mm -hmm. So we've got to take care of what we got. Correct, that's right. Mm -hmm. It's good. To see. Anything I'm missing? Jamal touched on something there, um, very important. Uh, when 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 Belizeans visit, they say, "How do monkey not get away?" Well, one, we have some electric fence there, but two, the main reason why they're well cared for. Where, where you gonna get with a? You, you, you see the bucket of food Francisco they bring? <laughs> you, know I mean? you, you you just go from tree to tree and climb up when you're ready and you get food. Yeah. That that is correct. We, as I said earlier, you know, we provide the best care for these animals. Um, you know, during the pandemic, the, the, the staff sacrifice a lot to make sure uh, the, the priority for us... During the pandemic? That, that's an interesting question. Chief, thanks to the support of the Belizean public, um, I, I tell you the support we got from the Belizean public was overwhelming. Uh, everybody may strap for cash and everybody was... was, was being um, very conservative with how they spend their money, but there was always extra to give to the zoo. Um, we would come in the morning and there would be a uh, bag of carrots, bag of cabbage, um, uh, or a couple pounds of fresh chicken that they get. So people passing by would, would leave us um, produce, fresh produce. Look at that. Yeah. What, what's going on there? Look at that. Uh, they're just, um, this, this is a family. This is a family that is in here, mom, baby, and aunt. And, and so they're just bonding there. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so, so, yeah, so some people would call us and say, hey, I just, I just paid for 25 pounds of chicken, the, the um, quality poultry, when you pick it up. And, um, of course, those that could afford cash, well, they send us one lead deposit slip and say, we gave something for feed the animals. We hope it helped. And men, for the pandemic, that is really what, what got us through. I mean, traditionally, the larger portion of our uh, support donation came from the U.S. But for 2020, 2021, the largest portion of donations came from Belize. And what, what happened is that during that time, uh, or like, like let's say we, we get a hurricane or we get a fire. It's, it's only us this time that the whole world was feeling the pandemic. And so our supporters um, were really holding back uh, and see where their donation would make greater impact. And so they would send to us and say, hey, here's something. I hope it would help. 
Um, but they're probably also supporting other organizations, just like the zoo. Yeah, but but the Belizeans, we can't thank them enough for the support they've given um, uh, during the pandemic and still continue to give because we have uh, a membership program. Basically, you can buy a membership to the zoo and you're entitled to annual visits to the zoo. You get updates via email uh, as to what's happening at the zoo. And um, we get adapt an animal. So some people for Christmas, they send, they adapt spider monkey, they adapt jaguar, they adapt tapir, and their kids or their nieces and nephew would get a package from the zoo saying, congratulations, your auntie just adapt Linda the jaguar in your honor and, and basically provide her with a photo. And, and so we've also had to be creative on, on in, in how we, we move forward. That's great, very creative indeed. Yes. Yeah. How much it costs to adopt an animal roughly? It, it varies. Um, I think it's around $100. I would say averages around $100. I mean, it helps us. It helps us. How often? Uh, once a year. Once a year. Once a year, yeah. It's, right. it's, it's annual. And then we, well, the thing is that we hope that several people will adopt, you know, and we want to make it something that, that you can afford. You know, I mean, if you got two, three picnic or two, three niece, if you could adopt one jaguar, one tapir, the harpy eagle, that three hundred dollars that that will go a long way. Uh -huh. is, is, is one animal adopted by more than one person, or once somebody adopts an animal, yeah, so it's we, not it's we not. Get, um, we, we get family. We get, we get some family who adopt, like a family will adopt um, a tapir for a year or a jaguar for a year, and that's fine because it's it's not the money. It, it, it's it's the conservation message we're saying, yeah. and and they're also helping out at the same time with the, the hundred dollars, hundred and fifty dollars that they're sending for us. Now I'm amazed by the amount of work you do here, and this this is this is something we should boast to the world. We have the, a unique zoo in the world, and uh, there's no when you go to other zoos you see cement and cages. <laughs> right. Um. We uh, a couple of years ago, one of the travel guides referred to the zoo as the best little zoo in the world and 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 we definitely agree with that and so we've used that as as one one of our one of our motto no it's 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 the best little zoo in the world indeed again tribute to sharon sharon matola right her vision is really what got us here yeah. we will have much more on our visit after these words from our partners <laughs> We are the Barry, offering you great products, good service, and of course, the lowest prices in the entire country. Visit us in Belize City, Belmapan, San Ignacio Cayo, Orndrag, and now in San Pedro, La Isla Bonita. The Barry. Get more? Pieles. Shell V Power, with three times more cleaning and friction reducing molecules. Go well! Go Shell! Since 2008, the Belize Natural Energy Charitable Trust has created opportunities for Belizeans to develop themselves and their communities. The Trust employs tools that are intuitive, collaborative, and accessible so that every Belizean is empowered to achieve their full potential. Over 200,000 Belizeans have been impacted because of our various initiatives. The Belize Natural Energy Charitable Trust, empowering Belizeans of today to create the Belize of tomorrow. I remember the days when trucks used to line up the Guatemala border and we could have only watched as they come in loaded with LPG and then left with we Belizean dollars. Things changed since, because the Belizeans they drive now, that we have the jobs and are definitely proud to be able to keep my dollars home. Either Elvis Roaches and either one of the Belizean drivers for the National Gas Company. I hauled butane from the new state-of-the-art terminal that the port of Big Creek. The hard work, but at the end of the day, I go home to my family and provide for them. Thanks to NGC, I did do my leap part to build my country. We the all Belizeans on this team, and we're proud to work hard to deliver one product will last longer and give you more value for money. I proud to work at NGC, and for you we Belizean people. 
the National Gas Company Belize Limited, fueling Belize forward. Yeah, Jamal, so we are looking at a vulture here. Um, so we have, in Belize, we have, about, we have four species of vulture. And what we're looking at here is a young king vulture. That's why you see all the black on the back and on the wings, no? Um, the vultures are the one that we call John Crow? Correct. So this is the king John Crow. So if you want to put John it like Crow. That. Yes. Okay. So this is the largest. And once you get full adult plumage, it tends to be more attractive or at least prettier than the other vultures, no? So this is Milagro. And he is two years old. He was born here in the zoo two years ago. Mm. Um, so full size already, body, body size. But the plumage, they take about five to six years to mature. So you come back next year, the following year, you still and got some of that black until they finally get the full two-tone, the white and black, like his mom and dad. So it'll take, like I said, about five or six years to so, get that level. So the king vulture is black and, black and white, right, Correct. basically. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the vulture itself, the, 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 the John Crow, the, 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 that's completely black, right? Correct. Yeah, that we have, so we have the black vulture that is full black with the gray head, and it has some, just some little silver like on the wingtips. Mm -hmm. But we also get the turkey vulture, which is more brown and has a red head. So, okay. And then there's one that looks very similar to the turkey vulture called the the savannah or the lesser yellow-headed vulture. So we have four. But these guys, they're not like we, the um, Natural Arm and Ministry of Health, they're the public health, um, the cleanup crew. So they oh, get cool. rid of all of the dead and rotting, decaying um, matter out in the wild, which could carry disease and pestilence. So they're really important for um, environmental health and in rural areas, public health, right? They yeah. clean up carcasses and stuff that might taint a water supply or, you know, end up causing, like I said, pestilence to come into a, a area that has children and so so. They do a lot for us and we don't even know it half the time and they do it for free. You don't have to pay them for the damn job. <laughs> <laughs> Any studies ever done as to why they could consume all these dead carcasses and dead meat and what have you and themselves survive consuming yes. something that would affect anybody else? Absolutely. So they have, they have a high, their, the acidity, the acid um, content of their stomach is probably twice what we have. So anything that goes into their stomach is just destroyed. Bacteria, viral agents, any kind of um, um, biotic or, or microbiomes that um, might impact like a human or even another hunter like a jaguar doesn't affect vultures. So it's just the, the acidic content of their stomach that does a lot of the work. Yeah. And that beak, even though it looks small, mm -hmm. is dangerous, right? Yes. So there's a bit of a hierarchy with, and it's a widening of the king, right? When a, a dead animal is found in the wild, you usually see the, the, the smaller junk crows, they circle, they come in, they land. The king vulture waits to see them find the carcass. Then they come in, push their way to the front, cut them big, and they start ripping open the carcass. But because they have a stronger beak, it actually helps that they eat first because they, make, they break it open and make it more accessible to the smaller vultures with the weaker bills, right? So the king eat first, then when he done, the others eat. So there's a, there's, a, there's a pecking order, right? Okay. Yeah. But yeah, it's a very, even though they don't actively hunt, they wait for dead animals. That beak is, is lethal. It can do some damage. And then the eyesight has to be very good, right? Because they, they have to spot up the carcass from yes. yeah. high above. Yeah, vultures, they, every, time, you know, every time you see vultures circling means they found something dead, but it means they're looking. They use, to save energy, they, they wait for like this time of day, actually, when the sun doesn't warm up the winds, you get these thermals pushing them up yeah. so they can float save energy and they can look you know a mile or two down the down the landscape yeah so they have about i think five a five foot wingspan big birds wow, that's a lot of wingspan. yes so they were using their eyesight the, the turkey vulture though which we know we don't have an exhibit here but they're very common have a, an excellent sense of smell as well okay. so they usually s s um, seek out the carcasses by scent mm -hmm. yeah so so they they, they would circle mm -hmm. See what they, what they want to get after the king. The, the 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 other vultures will come down. Yes. Then they wait for the king to come and do his whatever yes. he's well, picking and eat, and then 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 they take over. Correct. Well, they don't wait. No, they are good. Eh? But if he show up, then they have to back they off. Back up. Yes. Okay. They everybody they want. Wait for him. No, they everybody everybody they out for eat for themselves. But yeah. if he shows up, then yes, he can bully himself to the front, right? Cause he's big, so they don't mess with him. But like I said, they don't they may not know it at the time, but if he breaks it open, then there's more that they can pick at more easily, right? They don't have to spend a lot of time trying to break open like a like I said, like a, a, a dead tapir. Very tough skin, very you know, very dense, solid animal. You need something that can deal with that um, easily. Right. Interesting. And even in their kingdom, there's this pecking order, no? Yep, there's a, there's a ladder. That's right. And just some so, so historical context for you. Um, 
I'll trade out with Umberto because we actually have some some long-lived animals in this in this enclosure. So I'll oh, trade yeah. out with Umberto because he's, he's been here as long as they have. Uh, what Umberto <laughs> animals <laughs> and, uh, as as well as human way in here? Yeah, actually we have <laughs> one guy by the name of Rex. Rex, a, a vulture? Yes, um, he he came from another zoo. Um, is he that was him up there? That's which one is that? That's Rex. That's Rex, right? Yeah. And then we have um, we have Milagro right here. Rex is actually over 30 years, you know. 30 years old? Yes, and they can live quite a long time. So, uh, three years ago, oh, we thought there was no, no mating going to happen. And boom, Milagro there, came. Milagro came. Mm -hmm. And that's why that's how she named Milagro. Milagro. Yeah. So, but yeah, Rex, Rex is, the, is the dominant, He's the dominant, the dominant yeah. bird in, in, in here. In this, in this group here. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so 30 years old. 30 years old, yes. And That's he would live for for how long? Probably 50 and still continue, you know, having having youngs producing then. And how, how, how about the ordinary black junk crow that we that, that we know? How how long? Do, what's I their lifespan? I think they would have the same almost the same lifespan. You know, okay. you know, normally in birds they have quite a long um, lifespan. So when they said junk crow take long for dead, that means that mean um, 30. Uh, we could we could easily say over 30 years. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. there goes Milagro. Um, and has been what, the second, the second um, hatchling that we have here. So mm. we're successful with breeding vultures, vultures. but we're not re into reintroducing. It's just to, to have a number, you know, to, to represent more here. Okay. You know. Normally, when when the drizzle or the rain, you will see the birds spread their wing. Okay. You know, they enjoy they enjoy the the, the drizzling and the. And, and the wetness, no? They just but what would be his wingspan? More, more, more. His wingspan, feet, his wingspan you know? would be six feet. About six feet. So, so he, my height would more be more or less uh, his wingspan. Almost, if you. Yeah. Wow. It doesn't look so, you know, because you see him no, there. It doesn't. It don't, so. it don't look so at all. When he spread, he's spread it, it's almost, you know, I could say. Oh. What's my boy? Yeah, man. What's my boy? Yeah. What's what's his name again? In the, um, I want to turn sideways because he's looking at you sideways, sideways. right? Sideways. Yeah, he can't. He doesn't look. He doesn't look front on. So see. Max. So now you're looking at his me. Name's, his name is Max. 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 Right, Max. Max Adranko, the vulture. Look at that. What's that pouch under his throat? That's all where the, the food goes in. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, pretty junk, right? Not true. Yeah, well, King vulture. Yeah. Because I'm actually not junk. Because I don't got queen, right? So they only got a king. Okay. Yeah, right. So just, Chief, look at the size of the wing. Yeah. Easily, if you know, he's like maybe four feet. The other guy could have six feet. Six feet because yeah. It's bigger. This bigger, yes. It's far bigger. Right. So one of the things, Jamal. You wouldn't also, want to get your fingers in. No, there. no, because it's very strong beak. Oh, no. I could tear you apart. Um, he can push his head into the carcass without getting any bacteria or any of that. That's the reason, the baldness on that. Okay. Yeah, so you could, he could stick his head into the, into a dead carcass. Okay. And not getting, I'm not getting it infected. But another black junk rock can do that, right? Um, they would do that too. Okay. Because they're, they, they, they. Wow, look at that. Man, amazing. Wow. Yeah, so, so how the zoo works is we, we always need to have um, more representations uh, of the, in, the individual uh, species so that we could have, you know, if one, you know, pass away, if Rex, you know, is 30 years, mm -hmm. then we have another representation there. We have in another. In mind, there's someone he's talking at this. Uh -huh. I don't think I get close to it. <laughs> this man when he's talking at this um this, this wire here, uh -huh. he's saying I if testing to see if we can open it, right? right we can so burst it. If they keep keeps doing that, maybe, but yeah. you know, he's looking at you know, food. So, food, so he's saying uh, let, let's take this out. This is in my way. Yes, this is in my way. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, I still got my finger. Max, Max, Max didn't go to my finger. <laughs> I've checked it. Max didn't go. Chris still didn't check my finger. <laughs> He's still here. <laughs> I thought the food he just consumed is in that little pouch there. This is my finger, Max. No, you, you, no, no, get too fan, no get fancy ideas, okay? So that's where all the digestion, digestion starts. Mm -hmm. um, once he digests it, then that goes flat. You don't see that anymore. We understand Max. Yeah. <laughs> Look at him. He doesn't want us to go. No. He wants more want attention, more food. more food, yes. More food, more That's food. how you motivate them, you know. It's with food, so. There we go, Max. Yeah. Fresh chicken, Max. Fresh chicken. Not a seal thing where I get to be on the outside. I mean, that is how you want the meat, no? Fresh. Yeah. Um, But like other birds, uh, vultures and uh, other birds can only see sideways, right? They can only see right. on the side. They can't the see they can't in see front. Part. They have to turn their heads in order to, 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 to see you. They, you know, they, they can turn their, their head 270 oh. degrees. Okay. Um, but his one is fixed. All right. All right, let's okay. move on. We, we, we diverted a bit and went to see the John Crown Macaw and the King Vultures. And uh, just now, you know, the macaws, these are the macaws we, 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 we said we were heading to. Um, macaw parrot, we call it, right? Yeah, macaw parrot, that, that is exactly how we call it in Belize. So, of the nine, nine species of parrots we have in Belize, the scarlet macaw is the largest. Uh -huh. And um, the scarlet macaw, I, I think for <laughs> Belizeans, most people know them because of the the, the poaching event happening in the Chiki Bull, um, that, that, that's a big, uh, it's a current issue in Belize. And what we have here are three scarlet macaws. Now, I don't work with them on a daily basis, but the zookeepers, uh, Umberto, Jamal, then, then, then can differentiate them. Mm -hmm. um, but each one of these scarlet macaws have a unique story as to why, yeah. why they're in this exhibit. Jamal, and Jamal, 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 Jamal can help me with that. Jamal, help me with the story, yeah, man. Uh, let's start, I'll, I'll point to which one you're ta talking about. Okay. <laughs> so what do we have here, Jamal? We have uh, Pirate and George. So uh, Pirate is uh, obvious where he got his, um, her name, sorry. So she unfortunately had to have a, a foot amputated, which is the reason she's in the zoo. So she was found in the wild with this bad injury, um, taken to the Belize Wildlife and Referral Clinic had the amputation and then transferred to the zoo as a non-releasable scarlet macaw, no? This is pirate here. Yes, right up front. Right up front. Yeah, so yeah. obviously, uh, you know, they rely a lot on their feet uh, as much as their wings and their beaks. So having one is a, a handicap, a disadvantage. Yeah, yeah. So pirate was brought here. Next to her is George, the scarlet macaw. Uh -huh. And George was actually confiscated from the wildlife trade. So we're not exactly sure how old he is. Same with pirate, it's hard to tell ages, but we know George is quite old, he's bigger, he's more wrinkled in the face, so he's probably easily in his 20s, uh -huh. um, which for a macaw is nothing. They can live a very long time. How long more or less do they live? In the wild, on average, it's around 30 or 40 years, but in uh -huh. ideal conditions, they can live well above 50, 60 years. So uh -huh. all the parrots are very long lived, but the macaws especially, they live decades and decades if they get the right um, nutrition and the right you know, environment to thrive in. No? And these are really endangered, right? Correct. So because. globally, if you go to Costa Rica or other countries in South America, you'll find hundreds of macaws, no problem. The issue with ours is the one that is, occurs in Belize is a subspecies. It's, um, it has a lot more blue in the primary and secondary feathers, and it's bigger than the, the, the maca, scarlet macaws you find as you go south. Mm -hmm. And our guys are isolated. There's no breeding that happens between them and the ones in Guatemala or Mexico or Honduras. They're very much a little island. And as most Belizeans know, they get poached um, in the chicky bull every year during the breeding season. So they're seized from the forest, taken across the border to Guatemala and beyond. They don't only stay in Guatemala, they're put in the illegal wildlife trade, the black market uh, globally. And I mean, they, they just go to the highest bidder. So the last time they did a, like a census of macaws, they did like a, a rapid study. Mm. They put them at our own, maybe 300 individuals that we had it left that's in Belize. Right. That's that's you know that's not a, a perfect number, but that's what they counted in a single effort nationally, wow. uh, around 300. Wow. It is. Um, it, you know, when you do biology, your rule of thumb is you should have at least 500, 500. 
uh, mature individuals, so ones that can breed is a good you know, rule of thumb. So they're below that by any means. And as I said, there's no mixture at, um, at, at breeding. So it's, they're definitely a bird that is challenged. Their survival is challenged here in Belize, right? So if I heard you correct, all, all macaws are larger than the ones you'd find in Costa Rica, or and, south and of our borders. South, and correct, yes. borders. Yeah, so um, if you want, you get technical, it's, it's uh, our subspecies is Ara Macau Cyanoptera. So they have a scientific name, but our guys are, are very much unique, unique. and isolated, uh -huh. yep. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, obviously there, there's a big pressure for them on the, in the pet trade because they're colorful, they mimic human speech very well. Um, so they're very, you know, they're very lucrative if they're caught and taken to the highest bidder. Can these mimic human speech? speech? They can. They do it when they want to, though. So George, for example, can say his name. He says hello. I think Ranger here can speak as well, but they do it. They don't do it on command. They do it when they feel like it. Okay. Um, so you, you have to kind of just have good timing to walk by and hear them say something um, human. <laughs> I think Ranger might know one of the keeper's names, too, I think. Or he's, he's picked, up. picked up. Yeah. And it's mostly repetition. You get, you know, you get thousands of visitors coming through saying hello, hi, pretty Polly, which is fine. We don't encourage it, but you know, we don't stop the public. We're just glad that they haven't taught them to say anything worse. Yeah. That's that's our only um, our only thing to be thankful for. Uh, I want to highlight Ranger here just because we've talked a bit about the chicky bull, um, and this is kind of a, a tip of the hat to the Rangers, the FCD Rangers that safeguard the chicky bull from illegal incursions and, and extraction of resources, right? So Ranger actually came from the Chicky Bull Forest and the reason uh, he is here is that his flight feathers didn't grow in properly and so he's unable to sustain flight. He can't fly the long distances you need to thrive as a macaw in the wild. So he was removed from the, the wild population and brought here to the zoo. And so his name is, is a... Ranger. Yeah, it's a tribute to the guys that, that protect our resources on a daily basis in very dangerous situations, right? But when you say he can't fly the distance, what distance do they normally so fly? He, he could take off, but he'll start, like, he'll basically be on balance, so he'll oh, start okay. keeling over. So he won't be able to fly properly in the wild. Um, so he can't fly away either. So actually, Ranger is actually, he's trained to come out and sit on perches and so on. So he's, he gets, he can get more yard time than the others that, that can actually fly properly, you know? Okay. So he's more, um, he's, especially during the pandemic and right before, he was interacting a lot more with the guests. Mm -hmm. Ranger! Ranger. Ranger, Pirate, and George. Ranger, Pirate, and George. George yeah. And George is like King George, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, Chief, yeah. would you like to give them a little, a little treat? Oh, pepitos? Yes, so just like pepitos us. Pepitos look they small, love, man. They love the pepitos. But what they're, about my finger? You just, your finger will be fine. They want this. So their beaks are almost like a hand. It's very accurate. You so try you one. Let me see. Let hold me, on, let hold on, me, hold on, let hold me um, demonstrate. So here you go. One for Pirate. Here you go, Pirate. And then one for George. Okay. So you can try giving George one. They, they just want the seed, right? <laughs> okay. This is what they're good at. They're good at well, breaking the open hard nuts and seeds to get the insides. You'll see. Oops. Okay, pirate. You see good how at they retrieving too. Mm -hmm. So the, the beak and the, the tongue operate in unison and they can they can spin them around and get them cracked open to get the good stuff. So one of their functions in the wild is sea dispersal, right? Okay. They're very messy eaters and stuff that they may not consume falls on the forest floor and can be sprout if it's in good soil, no? Mm -hmm. So they're like one of our gardeners. You have a lot of um, herbivore species like tapir, monkey, parrot that help keep the forest healthy by spreading seeds around. So it's just the seed they want, they crack that up, take Correct. out the seed and throw it tr yes. and dump the trash. But their general diet, obviously, these are just snack we they give them. The, the keepers give them a very diverse diet of fruits, veggies, you know, a lot of seed filled fruits that they can work their way around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So where do we go now? <laughs> All right, stop real up. Bit of a dis disagreement. I can't help but notice, guys, uh, when, you, when we walk, the signage, you know. Um, this one by Mahatma Gandhi, who is one of um, the most um, well-known emancipators, if you want to put it, or he led India to independence. Mm -hmm. You know, he's the father of India, Mahatma Gandhi. He says, the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. Mm -hmm. So this says a lot for us here in Belize mm -hmm. by treating our animals the way we are treating our animals here in in the zoo and teaching other Belizeans to appreciate and to treat our animals well mm -hmm. is a way that we will be judged. So 
guys, let's take care of what we got, you know. Um, take care of our animals, you know, and, 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 the, and if you want to know how to do so, come to the Belize Zoo. <laughs> and then you learn right. and to a, appreciate them. Just another note for you, Chief, since we're talking about Sharon's legacy. I'm sure you noticed, but this, that's, that's her handwriting. That's right, yeah. So one of the things the zoo is well known for is our, our handwritten, you know, very personalized, informal signs that really, you know, a lot of people don't like big, complicated signage. They want simple messaging that they can, simple takeaways. And so, as we know, Sharon is no longer here, but Umberto and others, we've, we've learned to replicate her, her font, if you will, and make it part of the zoo's branding okay. and keep that unique aspect of the zoo of how we communicate with the public mm -hmm. through the messaging and just the, the style. So that's a big part of Sharon's legacy of engaging and educating people that, that remains at the zoo and will continue to be so. Her legacy will live on like, like that we are experiencing right now. This is, this is a man-made panel that's dug out when the zoo moved to this site, but it's become its own little ecosystem. It has, you know, fresh water fish, it has a cock, as you remember, chief, a lot of different turtles, mostly, <laughs> mostly Bokotoa, but Along with the um the turtles, so they, they coexist. They no fight. They no they no they no hold grudge. They just all hang out in the same area. And these are turtles indigenous to Belize. They be um, freshwater turtles like Bokotora, yes. Hikite, and uh, what, what are they? The two main ones we have the Hikite, but we also have the red -eards. Um So unfortunately, we do have some invasive. We have the red -eared slider that is. A close cousin of the Bokotora, the, the native one, uh -huh. and these are usually what people buy as pets in like Chetomal and other places. They get them at the pet shops and they bring them back, smuggle them home, and when they get too big, a lot of people have been releasing them into like rivers and ponds in Belize, and some of them they bring to the zoo. So the red-eared slider is a invasive species now in Belize that competes with our Bokotora, with our native one. Yep. So just like you know, others were familiar with like tilapia and so on, you do have invasive turtles uh -huh. in Belize, no? Interesting, yeah. I, didn't, yeah, I wasn't aware of that. When we come back from this break, we will wrap up the first portion of our visit to the Belize Zoo. We are the Barry, offering you great products, good service, and of course, the lowest prices in the entire country. Visit us in Belize City, Belmapan, San Ignacio Cayo, Orndrag, and now in San Pedro, La Isla Bonita, Dibari. Get more, Pieles. Cell V Power with three times more cleaning and friction reducing molecules. Go well, go Cell. Since 2008, the Belize Natural Energy Charitable Trust has created opportunities for Belizeans to develop themselves and their communities. The Trust employs tools that are intuitive, collaborative, and accessible so that every Belizean is empowered to achieve their full potential. Over 200,000 Belizeans have been impacted because of our various initiatives. The Belize Natural Energy Charitable Trust empowering Belizeans of today to create the Belize of tomorrow. I remember the days when trucks used to line up the Guatemala border and we could have only watch as they come in loaded with LPG and then left with we Belizean dollars. Things changed since because the Belizeans they drive now and we have the jobs and are definitely proud to be able to keep my dollars home. Either Elvis Roaches and either one of the Belizean drivers for the National Gas Company. I hauled butane from the new state of the art terminal to the port of Big Creek. The hard work, but at the end of the day, I go home to my family and provide for them. 
Thanks to NGC, I did do my leap out for build my country. We the all Belizeans on this team, and we proud to work hard to deliver one product will last longer and give you more value for money. I proud to work at NGC, and for you we Belizean people. The National Gas Company Belize Limited, fueling Belize forward. We're at the Kilbil Tukan, our national bird, and the croaking song you're hearing in the background is just one of several songs the Tukan can make. Um, as to why it's making that song right now, um, we really can't answer that for you. Yeah. But what other songs you would make besides what we're hearing? Um, I don't know if any of these guys can imitate them, but I, I definitely can't. Ja Jamal is the birder in the group, so he, he can tell you a little bit more about the, the, the... I mean, we've heard, we only hear one right now, but they're all like croaking songs, yes. right? They're yeah. all croaking songs they make. So croaking, they do like a little trilling sound, and usually this one they're doing now gets higher in pitch as they get more into it, and especially if there's several toucans that join in in like a chorus, they get just get higher and higher in pitch, and so it's... It's definitely a form of communication. We're just we don't know two can, so we don't understand what they try to tell we. <laughs> let, let me let me record him and see if we. So we one of the questions we get one lot is so what is it the the, the beak made of no and and you you have any idea, chief? It's, it's like um, cow horn, like like um, no. Kind of. It's like your finger and toenail. Yeah, like, like toenail. Yes, um, um. Yeah, so, um, and if you look at the beak, it, it has like a serrated, it looks like answer. Come. Mm. Maybe maybe we make Umberto give and try. Maybe you know they you recognize like me. It's used, yeah. You used to Umberto. Huh. Let's see, let, let, let's see. Huh. What's the name of this particular token? You, you, you gave him a name? It's a Dodger. Dodger. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Look like Dodger used to you, man. But why why would a, the the toucan have such a long uh, beak? What what advantage that would that give it? So the the toucan is a couple reasons they've theorized. One, it's the big bill is very light. It's made of um, the outside is made of keratin, as as Celso mentioned. Same stuff we have in our fingernails yeah. and so on. But inside it's like it's very spongy uh, tissue. Oh. So very and there's a series of, of blood vessels running along it. So it's really good for heat loss. So it's a, a large surface area that can lose heat very quickly, in a, especially when you live in a tropical environment. Um, so that's one reason that they have a big bill, right? The other one is it helps with, because it's so light and they're light in general, they can sit on you know, a tiny little branch and reach into like a bramble or, or a thicket to reach uh, berries. Sometimes they even take bird eggs, little lizards. So they have a very varied diet, but they can pluck stuff quite easily with their long bill. And as you see there, they swallow it whole, right? Mm -hmm. So unlike parrots and other birds, toucans don't really chew their food. Their beaks aren't very strong, as big and, and dangerous as they look. They have to take stuff that is soft and bite-sized that they can just consume in one gulp. So they have a couple advantages to having the, the bill, no? But the male and female look the same, the same color, same size and everything. So it's, it's not a, um, at least from what we see, it's not a, a, a mating advantage or a display. It's more for, for functionality. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, at the toucan just now, and he hit the, his bill against the the, the the stick there, and you heard it like um, click, 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 yeah, like it. Yep. So you know it's uh, hollow, you know. Yes. So he's and cleaning whatever left on the yep. outside. Yeah. And if the sun hits it just right, you can actually see almost through it. It's almost like um, translucent. It's so it's very it's a light, a, a hollow structure. Yeah. Yep. It just looks heavy, you yeah, know. It's heavy, yeah. It looks heavy and clumsy, but but, but it's light. Making a difference. Have, oh, there are different yeah. species of toucan. Yeah. We have um, three species of toucan in Belize. We have the Kilbil toucan that we're seeing here. That's very relatively common. We have the colored arasari, which is a smaller toucan. It has like a band across the belly. Mm -hmm. And then the most rare is the um, the emerald toucanet. So that one's this very beautiful, like shiny green that tends to be more forest dwelling, right? Um, all three are are native. But what we I always like to highlight with our national bird is it's thankfully one of the species that isn't endangered at least not there's no direct threat to it we usually when we do these tours we have to say oh the makai endangered tapir endangered the monkey but 
toucans are, are relatively stable and you can see them there. They can adapt very easily to human disturbance. So you could find them on Forest Edge near most villages and towns. Have you even seen photos of them popping up in Belize City, right? Wow. Yeah, coming in from the maybe from the um near the Belize River. So they're they're doing quite well. The other two are a bit more uncommon just because they prefer forest, right? Wow. Yeah. But those you can see sometimes too, um, when you really, I, I, I think it's an Ignacio Hotel. Uh -huh. um, they, they, you see them come right up to the, almost up to the, to the railing. To the, exactly. Really. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They, yeah. So they're they're bold enough. They they are comfortable enough around people to come within proximity. They'll keep their distance, but they don't mind, you know, sharing sharing habitat or coexisting near uh, human co uh, near communities and development. So we always it's something that we like to boast to. Visitors to Belize that you know it's if with enough time and if they're looking out, tourists can there is a likelihood that they'll see a, the national bird while they're exploring Belize, you know, driving up the highway or going on a forest hike. And the noises that we hear it makes um, would be re resonating in the beak itself, right? Correct. From, from, from the way how it sounds, mm -hmm. it, it sounds like it makes a noise and the beak starts to amplify it or, or changes it and that kind of thing. Yeah. And as we were discussing earlier, this is just one toucan, but they are fairly social in the wild. So you could get like, you know, half a dozen toucan hanging out and they all start making that same noise you're hearing and it gets louder and higher in pitch as they, they get more into it. So they kind of give away their location just by their voice. Okay. And so Penny, tell me, tell me about Penny. Go ahead. Yeah, all right. So, um, yeah, so Penny, Penny, this is a crested guan or locally known as the guan bird. Mm -hmm. It's one of the, the birds that are in the family of the chickens. Okay. Um, and so it's it's been hunted out there for the meat. Okay, um, so it eats like chicken? It tastes like chicken? I haven't tasted it, but I know it's been hunted out there a lot. Uh -huh. It's a game bird. Is it endangered uh, or yet? Uh, or is it uh, abundant? They're endangered. No, they're not endangered. Um, but they're, as I said, they're being hunted out there. And Penny was one of the birds that was being... <laughs> Uh, taken into Guatemala mm -hmm. by the Chateros mm -hmm. and then it was confiscated, taken to the referral clinic for rehabilitation um, and then transferred to the zoo. Mm -hmm. so, so Penny, you know, was released back into Chiquibul, mm -hmm. but she kept, kept coming back to the same site, no? okay. to the ranger site, so I decided to remove her from there and bring her to the zoo right. where, you know, she's the ambassador for, for the Kwan species. Yeah, okay. um, I don't know, Chief. If you if you ever hear about um, when we feed the bones to the to the dogs, uh -huh. the dogs and get crazy. Uh -huh. These are one of the birds. These are the myths. Myth. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so but, but feed his bo bones to the dogs. The dogs uh, went crazy. They go crazy. They call it in Spanish. They call it chileo. And I think there have been some research going on on that oh. on that on that thing on the on feeding the bones to the. To, to the dogs, no, and then go so crazy. Human beings enjoy them. Human beings hunt them, enjoy them. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Right. So Rio Penny, you know, she was being smuggled to to Guatemala side by mm -hmm. Chateros, but she ended up here. Okay. You know. So Penny was lucky. Penny was lucky to stay home. Right, so she was rescued. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, she would have been somewhere, you know. In a, and you say people hunt these birds? Yes, they do. Including um, the Cocrico, the one we call the Cocrico, Coco. Chachalacas, and the Great Caraso. Okay. Yeah. So we're going now to the... This is Hoodwink. Is yeah, and Hoodwink is a spectacle owl. And most people who are familiar with the zoo storybook, or the children book, uh, written by Sharon. Sharon used Hoodwink as the wise owl telling stories about wildlife in Belize. Uh -huh. um, but yeah. we pass by because these are nocturnal animals. So would it wouldn't come out on right now? It probably would come out because, again, he habituated to human. Uh -huh. And so he would probably make an appearance occasionally. Um, for the nocturnal critters, you know, in the Neotropics, most of the animals are nocturnals. And so the zoo has a Belize Zoo at night experience. Okay. And so we have guests who come to the zoo and uh, experience the zoo at night. We, must, we have to try that one of these nights, one. Uh, come on, see, see the nocturnal experience. It must be amazing. Yeah. Definitely, because that's when you'll find the tapir active, you'll find the margay, 
um, the smallest spotted cat, you find a jaguar. And so you have, as I said, you know, most of the animals in the neotropics are nocturnal or crepuscular, so they're active at dawn and dusk. Mm -hmm. So we keep heading now towards the ocelot and we might stop again because um, a lot of interesting things are on the, on the road to the ocelot. Here we have a barn owl. Where will where, where a barn owl be? Barn owl there. Up there, yeah, sitting up there for true. Yeah, so and, and another interesting species, and, and this one here, yeah, most of us, when we see the barn owl around the house, we, we think about an omen of death, the, the bad luck. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so one one of the things Sharon has done is she's written a book using um, one of one of the owl she cared for from Chick, uh, Happy, Happy the owl, uh -huh. and Happy has uh, uh, told stories about the importance of these birds. Um, farmers they they tend to kill them. People tend to kill them, but these birds are good pest control mm -hmm. so they feed on rats they, they, uh, especially around the farm or even in uh, the tongues mm -hmm. in a tongue limit you find the barn owl would be um, very 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 important for controlling the pest population particularly rat mm -hmm. you find them like maybe in Belize City would you find a barn owl there? yeah definitely um, occasionally we've had instances where where people would call us because they would have a nest uh, with chicks and, and, and they're afraid that the chicks wouldn't make it or they, 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 um, people would kill them so they would call the zoo out in, to assist and remove those chicks okay. so that they could be safe. So yes, you get them in, in Belize City. A lot of rats there, mm -hmm. you know, so... That's, that's why I asked the yes, question because yeah, on Big Charlie Price... Big Charlie the, Price. Yeah. But before they get big, you know, they, they also would eat this, the small right. ones, okay. you know, to control the, the population of rats. rats. Yeah. Right. Okay, Chief, so this, this, this is the parrot collection we have here. Um, brings us to the end of today's tour. Um, what we have here are several species of parrots, and all of these parrots here were confiscated. Uh, they, they were kept as pets. And the, the yellow-headed parrot is probably the number one mascot, the number one pet in Belize. People like hunt them, no? We, we have them nesting right around here in our protected area, the Sharon Matola Wildlife Sanctuary. Um, you said the yellow-held parrot is the one that talks the most, huh? That talks the best? Or they, they, like? They're a great mimic. That, that is correct. They're a great mimic. They, they, they can copy human songs and the song like then they talk and sometimes to the point people think they actually they have a conversation with you. Mm -hmm. But really they're just great copycat. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great. yeah I was doing a show in, at Payne's Creek where they have a yellow parrot um, conservation program as well. The, the tide has, has, has that program going. Right, that, that is correct, yeah. yeah. Uh, but you, you don't only have yellow head parrots here, you have different types of parrots, right? That is correct. In this exhibit, we have different different species of parrot we uh -huh. have over here. The one here, no, 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 mark my hand, he's green. Oh, here's a red. And So right in here we have three, we have three, three species, three species. Yeah. Three species. So the, the big one up there are the mealy parrot. Mealy? Yeah, the mealy you see with the blue, the blue, um, blue crest, blue, 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 head, crumb. blue crumb. Yeah, and then this one here is the, this is the red lord. This is another one that people like get as uh -huh, pet yeah, if, they know, if they if they don't catch it, then if they don't catch the yellow head, then going with the red lord, and then to the back we have the the white fronted, smaller, smaller than these two that we're seeing here. Okay. And again, these were all brought here. They, they were they were in the pet trade, so people has them as uh, had them as pets, pets, no? Yeah. Yeah. Parrots. But the parrot population in Belize, um, if we're not careful, will become extinct. That's particularly the yellow head parrot, right? So we have two parrots that are at risk: uh, the yellow-headed parrot, which is an endangered species, and we have the scarlet maca, which Jamal explained earlier is a subspecies of scarlet maca and is very rare. So, estimates about 300 of them in the wild here in Belize. So those are the two species of uh, conservation concern. And so we need to watch out for them. But all parrot species in general, no, they're, they're, they're good seed dispersers. 
So if people ask, you know, where role parrot play in the yeah, ecosystem, the they disperse seeds, that, that is what they do. Yeah. All right, so this brings us safely to the end of part one. We'll have part two coming up. So we want to tell you that you look out for part two of our tour of the best little zoo in the world. Okay, so stay tuned. And it's all about love. So we say, Belize and beyond. Thanks for choosing love. Belize Watch, knowledge of the past, impacting the present, building the future. Celebration time. It don't matter what part of the jewelry come from. You are you and me are me. But guess what?